I'm really delighted today to be here and to welcome so many participants, uh, women and men from a variety of professional spheres. Um, let me introduce first of all Bashir Konde, who is my colleague, is going to co-chair the session with me. And I would like also to thank, of course, the dream team behind the scene. The dream team is composed by Beatrice Paola and Zeya. Those who don't see, but they are really supporting us technologically and technically. So um, the roundtable today has, uh, is part of a project that has been implemented by UNIDA in the last eight years, promoting women empowerment through, uh, um, sorry, promoting women empowerment for inclusive and sustainable industrial development, which is a project happening in seven countries of the MENA region and is funded by the Italian government and labeled by the Union for the Mediterranean with the participation of FAO and UN Women. The project has been launched in 2015 and seeks to enhance women economic inclusion and promoting sustainable and inclusive growth by harnessing the potential of women entrepreneurs with seven, within seven countries, which, which are Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestine, and Tunisia. ICT is a main sector of attention of this project, particularly digital technology in the manufacturing sector and how we can support women and enhance their participation in the ICT sector. We know uh, we, because we undertook, UNID undertook a recent survey uh, amongst 1,400 women, we know that women have entrepreneurs access to and use of ICT and digital technology, uh, it's, it's a bit of, uh, it's operating particularly in the manufacturing sector. Uh, the surveys have shown that 97% of respondents have a high level of use of ICT for business purposes, but only 18% use digital technologies in the manufacturing process or smart systems. And as you know, UNIDO works for AD, uh, SDG9, so industry is our main mandate and manufacturing development and support to the manufacturing sector is our main uh, scope of work. Now, why is that so? Uh, we know that affordability and lack of digital skills remain some of the key barriers as, uh, for access to ICT by women, particular women entrepreneurs, especially in the world least developed countries. According to ITU data, and we will learn more about that, 40 out of 84 countries for which data are available, less than half the population has basic computer skills, such as copying or file or sending an email with an attachment. So what are the discussion here, of course, uh, the context in which we are operating right now, which is a special context we have we are going through a crisis. The COVID time has been a crisis for most of the women entrepreneurs, uh, for everybody, but I, in particular for women entrepreneurs. And, but on the other hand, the, chat, the opportunity is that is pushing us to go in further, to go very quick and very fast into digital world. Uh, so it's becoming an incredible accelerator uh, of the digital transformation, particularly in the industry. And we know also that one of the major difficulties encountered by women in this time is export and sales at local and international level. So how, how can we help women to really keep uh, the pace of the speed of the, uh, of the evolution of the economy, the way we are going? Um, so the round table will explore a number of topics. The first one is how public and private partnership can help scaling up the capacity and the capacity building activities, the skills training in the ICT sector for women economic empowerment to reduce the gender divide. The second one is what is the impact of industry 4.0 on women participation to labor market? What are the factors and good practices in increasing women's access to STEAM and skills training? This is something that some of the speaker will uh, particularly talk about. We will also learn about the latest data on women's access to this digital technology and the good practice in skills training. We will learn what is the role of women business associations uh, in supporting women in technology and what is the role of networking in a digital world. We will also listen from a Palestinian government representative talking about the progress made by his country. So the policy, which is a very important dimension because we all operate in an ecosystem. 
So the role of governments and uh, policy, it's tremendously important to support uh, the development of private sector and to favor investment. We will also have the voice, we will hear the voice of two women entrepreneurs from Tunisia and Egypt, and they will share with us the direct experience in supporting women entrepreneurs led and particularly to support startup led by women. And what is the impact of these women of the COVID on the startups? This is also a very important themes. So um, we, I, I would call now for the, our uh, esteemed speaker to briefly introduce themselves, starting by His Excellency Osama Al Sahadwi, Minister of State for Entrepreneurship and Empowerment for Palestine. Thank you, thank you, Monica. Thank you, and I, I'm pleased and honored to be uh, joining this brilliant meeting. Uh, first, uh, I would like to say that the, it's a new ministry, and we are now working to build the Palestinian ecosystem. I looked uh, after the survey you communicated yesterday with us. Most of the findings of the survey are applicable here in, in, in Palestine. And generally, uh, ICT opened uh, new opportunities for socio-economic development for women in Palestine. But in the meantime, it posed many challenges and problems. I will uh, yeah, go through these challenges and solutions uh, later. Uh, OK, uh, in, in, at this moment, I am pleased to say that uh, we have the political will to change uh, whatever needed uh, from, uh, at, the, at the level of uh, regulations at the governmental uh, level. And we are doing a partnership, uh, a good process in partnership between government, private sector, and uh, NGOs, because uh, NGOs are playing a, a significant role here in, in Palestine to, to historical uh, reasons. Thank you. Karen uh, Tuan. Hi, good afternoon, Monica, and to the esteemed panel and to our audience today. Thank you so much for your invitation for me to join. My name is Dr. Cara Antoine, and I am today president for Women in Tech here in the Netherlands. So I live just north of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, uh, speaking to you from there today. I'm part of a global movement uh, where we have now more than 23,000 followers around the world, uh, a movement that was formed by a fantastic technologist by the name of Ayumi Okumor. And Ayumi had a vision to try to help close the gap around the world in promoting the idea of getting more women excited about following a course of technology in their studies or in entering a career in technology. So I look forward to sharing with you in just a few minutes uh, some insights and learning that we have had as a movement around the world and on behalf of the, the chapters uh, representing the Netherlands today. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. Lia uh, Chenter. Audio? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Now Am I on? Fantastic. Very good. Very good. So hello everyone, my name is Leah Chenter, and hello of course to our wonderful audience and distinguished speakers and Monica, I'm really excited to be here today. I represent the uh, private sector, I work for Cisco. Uh, I'm the director heading up our system engineers globally, um, covering our mid-market commercial. And I think, uh, Cara, I, we live close by because I also live north to Amsterdam, so <laughs> we should check, check it uh, later. Um, I'm here also to share uh, best practices, use cases, and some tips on being a woman and being a, a woman minority in an in a, in a, um, interesting environment uh, in the uh, ICT world and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Liat. And now Fuad Siddiqui. Uh, hello, everyone. Great to, to see you across the digital uh, media. I'm uh, Fuad Siddiqui, Executive Partner and Vice President, Bell Labs Consulting. Uh, what we do at Bell Labs Consulting is we, we basically draw upon the, in the inspiration from Bell Labs, which is the research and innovation arm of uh, Nokia. So we take the disruptive research, we map it to the underlying economics, and then marry that towards our customers, our regions, and market reality. And all in an attempt to make sure that our key stakeholders in different markets are armed with a future-proof, uh, a future-backed sustainable transformation model uh, that they can actually work with. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm driving a, a global team of experts who is actually uh, vested in this. Delighted to be here um, and really looking forward to listen and learn from all you distinguished panelists and of course uh, the audience as well. Thanks. Thank you for that, Carla Licciardello. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, we really look forward to be part of uh, the discussion together with the, with, the, with the audience. So my name is uh, Carla Licciardello and I'm the Digital Inclusion Coordinator here at the ITU, which is the UN Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technology. And I uh, overlook at the portfolio, which uh, includes uh, uh, women and therefore uh, gender equality in, in particular, but also youth and children. And uh, really pleased to be here and, uh, and good luck to all of us for the session. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Amel Sainane. Hi, 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 everyone. Hi, distinguished speakers, and hi to all participants. Thank you, thank you, Monica. So uh, my name is Amel. I'm co-founder and uh, president of a startup association in Tunisia uh, called Tunisian Startups, and it's the startup that was founded by entrepreneurs and giving a voice to startups uh, in uh, in Tunisia uh, and uh, connecting uh, Tunisian startups uh, to the world. Um, I'm also a tech entrepreneur, a co-founder of uh, Beta Cube, which is a company building companies in fintech and uh, and mobility, and I'm also active in uh, several networks uh, uh, around uh, digital transformation, entrepreneurship entrepreneurship and innovation and I'm looking forward to sharing with you some insights about the positive momentum happening in Tunisia right now despite all challenges and how we can sustain this and, and mainly make sure that uh, women change makers uh, can have a leadership role in this momentum. Thank you, Amel. Rania, Rania Imam. Hello everyone, thank you Monica. Uh, my dear esteemed uh, partners and panelists and uh, distinguished audience, my name is Rania, I'm from Egypt. Uh, I run an enterprise named Entrepreneur, which is basically a network to support women entrepreneurs, early stage and advanced women entrepreneurs. We try to support them when, with all uh, relevant resources. Uh, also, I'm part of uh, Women Gender Innovation Agora with the UN as a consultant. And uh, I'm here basically to share and uh, let you know what are the best practices we've done in the past uh, three, four months during the COVID that enabled us to enhance uh, the process and support more women, especially because they're uh, defending different situations. And uh, also I'm here to listen for the esteemed uh, solutions that my partners will present. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a fantastic panel. We have a public and private sector represented, but also NGO and entrepreneurs. So I'm sure that we will reach some interesting recommendation at the end of the panel. Um, without further delay, I would like to, uh, to raise the first question for uh, the Excellency, the Minister of Palestine, and ask him what is the role of the government in terms of Palestine in, in terms of supporting women economic empowerment in the ICT sector, ICT and general digital technologies. And I'm sure also that your country has uh, successful cases of women uh, who managed uh, to really become uh, entrepreneur, well-established entrepreneurs in this area, uh, and what, how the, how the government supported the women in overcoming the obstacles and the challenges uh, faced by women. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and first, I'd like to say that the you know, Palestinian women here we are, have a very high skill. In terms of achievement in education, we noticed two days ago the higher school, uh, the secondary school uh, scores. 17 out of 20 came from females, the top 20 at the, the national level of uh, Palestine. The same thing applies in the universities. Uh, we found the highest uh, scores among females, despite the access to labor market is still very is still low. And uh, access to work, I think you know, their chance to get jobs uh, is much lower than females for many, uh, than males for many uh, barriers. Uh, and as a government, we are working to remove these barriers in order to give equal opportunities for uh, females and males in, in, in terms of access to decent work. 
uh, a lot of challenges are facing the, the, the sector and they, they have special burden on, on females. Uh, let me start with them uh, very fast. In terms of knowledge, you know, IT, IT sector is, uh, is a living science, day by, by day uh, development. So anybody out of business or out of schools or universities uh, will lose the, 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 the track and will not be up to date uh, in, in terms of science. So uh, as a government, we are encouraging uh, technical and Education and training, and, and we established a new institution uh, specialized for this uh, issue. In addition, uh, governmental and non governmental uh, NGOs have uh, special interventions targeting vulnerable women, especially in remote uh, areas, those have uh, difficulties in access to market or to, uh, to work. Uh, we have also uh, social barriers because you know, people uh, prefer males because, you know, f f females uh, need uh, maternity leaves, etc. And you know, we, found, we, we found many cases, women are uh, working at uh, salary scale much lower than the, the minimum delegated by the government. And uh, in terms of movement, especially for uh, remote areas, it's, it's difficult due to cultural reasons for the, the, the woman to move a long distance for, uh, for her job and come back at home. So they are you know, in remote areas, especially they are based at home. What are the solutions in this, uh, in, in this case? We are encouraging remote uh, outsourcing for women and uh, we are you know, focusing on training programs and development programs in, in this area. Uh, to, let, to let them work and uh, market their uh, products uh, at, at home. Many, many women are uh, marketing their uh, products uh, that are produced at, at home through Facebook or through, uh, through other uh, websites. Uh, in this case, uh, in addition, the Ministry of Labor is doing effort in uh, enforcing the minimum wages uh, law. In terms of infrastructure, we have a problem uh, with uh, access to internet, especially in remote uh, areas. In addition, uh, Israel controls uh, the, the, our borders and they, they ban the telecommunication equipment to be shipped to Palestine. Uh, up to, uh, in this moment, we have only 3G in the West Bank and 2G in Gaza. Uh, I think it's a global responsibility to enforce this issue to be to disappear, and we have the right to, to access to uh, an IT in the same manner as the rest of the, uh, the world. And we are encouraging uh, the government and the private sector to find solutions for remote uh, areas at lower uh, costs. Wireless, uh, wireless broadband and fiber air technologies are realized in the time being, and they solve many problem. In terms of hardware, especially for vulnerable families, they don't have either, they don't have access to a, a hardware like laptops and uh, etc. Or the family a, a size is a little bit uh, large, so they cannot find their share of using this uh, issue. I think in this uh, area, the NGOs put uh, good effort and the Ministry of uh, Social uh, Affairs and Development in availing these instruments for uh, vulnerable uh, women in particular. In terms of power, we have a, a problem with power, a strategic problem. We are importing 90% of our power from uh, Israel and that's not sustainable. In addition, in Gaza Strip, we are lacking around 60% of the power during the 24 uh, hours. What is the solution? We are putting efforts in, uh, in investing in renewable energy and uh, developing regulations to promote investment in renewable, renewable uh, energy. In, in, in regarding a networking uh, system, it, it's, it's not sufficient at the, at the, at the, in the current situation. Uh, so, uh, and each sector is isolated. I, there is not a cross-sectoral uh, uh, co coordination. The, uh, the government initiated from the past year the clustering concept in development, and that is tackling each, each cluster with coordination with our uh, clusters. 
In terms of uh, ownership of, of business, uh, women don't uh, have uh, ownership of business in, in general due to uh, many reasons. Uh, among them, uh, people, uh, they, they are not, uh, they don't, uh, to be true, they, they are not committed to the heredity uh, issues according to the law and Sharia uh, law. And the government is putting a lot of uh, effort in this uh, area, and uh, NGOs are doing good advocacy to the women's right to for the ownership of these uh, things. Uh, we have another barrier, linguistics and communication uh, skills. Uh, many, many females are not, uh, do not have the enough knowledge in relation to access to uh, sufficient to access to work through IT, uh, that that is dealt with the utmost care at the level of education in schools and in uh, vocational uh, training, and uh, a lot of training programs are ongoing in the time being. And the last barrier, let's say, access to finance. Uh, in generally, uh, in, uh, in line with your uh, survey, it's, it's the same applicable in, in Palestine. Females do not have access to, to loans. And what is the alternative? Uh, at, at the level of the Ministry of Entrepreneurship and Empowerment, we are developing in the time me, uh, being a, sm a smart uh, money investment fund that will uh, work with, uh, in, e in, in equal opportunity basis for uh, partnership, not, not, not for grants or uh, loans. It will be a partnership uh, approach. And thank you. Voice, Monica, your voice. Yes, sorry, sorry, Miss. Uh, no, I was just rebounding on what you said at the very beginning of your interven intervention, that you said that women have skills and education. Um, and I was interesting to, to hear some stories, success stories of women who have actually uh, managed to become successful entrepreneurs uh, in, in the field of I ICT. I met quite a few during conferences in Amman, but please, Minister, if you want to tell some of the stories. Yes, I, I have many stories. I will uh, give a brief about two stories. The first is uh, Sona Uthman. Sona is a, a founder and CEO of Tawazun, the first mediation and uh, mindfulness application in Arabic. She is a mother of the three children and uh, according to her, one spoiled dog. Okay. She studied chemical uh, engineer in 2018. She left she quit her permanent job and decided to take a new path to begin working on her idea to develop a technological tool that can change people's lives and change and it changes the mental and social situation in MENA region and can be reached by every Arabic reason including children. In November 2018, Sona began developing the mediation and mindfulness application with a small team, computer engineer, psychologist, and mediation expert. Together and with the support of the fund, private sector fund, they managed within less than a year to launch Tawazan app, app, app in October 2019 to Apple Store and Google Play. During the soft launch four month period and before it finished yet, Tawazun, led by Sona, managed to enter 13 countries in the MENA and around the world. With thousands of organic downloads, Tawazun managed to win Hub 17, 71 competition and MIT competition, leading to be the first upon 4,000 startups. Suna is also a social speaker in many universities, focusing on women and mom entrepreneurship. That's Suna. Another young lady, Amani Abutir, she's a natural war entrepreneur since the early age of six. Amani Abutir is, the, a, seri is a serial entrepreneur, inventor, engineer, and educator from Jerusalem with 10 years of experience in entrepreneurship and innovation. She works as advisor on a voluntary basis with the, my ministry, and she was one of the uh, co-founders of the uh, ICIP, which was the International Conference for Entrepreneurship in Palestine, 
it was done uh, together with uh, uh, around 2,000 uh, private sector companies from uh, West G from Germany. Aman is a co-founder of, uh, of, uh, of uh, and a CEO of Waza uh, in, in corporation leading education tech startup in the MENA region that incorporates artificial intelligence within education. Waza was features global in Forbes magazine and now Waza was selected to be part of Dubai Future Accelerators where they work under the umbrella of the Knowledge and Human Development Authority to support education in the United Arab Emirates. Aman is uh, powerfully uh, engaging internationally acclaimed keynote speaker with demonstrated activity and leadership, which led her to winning international and local honors, uh, honors and awards, including around 12 honors. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, I'm sure that during the conversation, we first of all, I have to say that you have already answered one of the questions from the audience, uh, which was asking how to how to support women uh, access to ICT through skills and education in rural areas. So thank you very much. Uh, and we have already an answer to the audience. But then now, um, and we will have chance to to come back to you uh, afterwards. And now I would like to rebounding on the topic of uh, uh, access to participation of women to the labor market, because this is what we are talking about, ICT and access and employment, employment opportunities for women, uh, basically, to, uh, for their economic empowerment. And um, according to our survey, UNIDO, uh, women are not really aware of blockchains and the challenge, the opportunities offered by the industry 4.0. Uh, and so I would like to ask to Fouad uh, Siddiqui, uh, what do you think from your perspective uh, as a private sector, but also a business consulting firm that works uh, with a big company, um, how do you see the, the challenges and the impact of the industry 4.0 to uh, 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 in relation to women access to ICT and digital technology. Uh, and also, what is the role of uh, uh, STEM education amongst women and girls in terms of how can we really, put, we have been talking in the last 10 years about access to STEM for women, but the rate are not increasing. And in some countries like Tunisia, where the rate of engineer is very high, uh, AML knows about that. You don't have the same rate than of women participating in the labor market. So, Fouad, what is your experience and how can you see from your perspective this, uh, this issue? You have the floor, Fouad. Uh, thanks, Monica. I mean, great question. I think it's it's a very interesting time as we move ahead, um, what we call the automation of everything era, uh, or you call it industry 4.0. But I think for your audience, uh, I'd like to somehow compare and contrast for them uh, at a macro level, uh, the comparison between the industries that we have digitized and automated versus what we call the physical industries. So it's important to understand that if you look at the total share of the world GDP, uh, digital industries contribute 30% of that. That is finance, media, journalistic services, insurance, professional services, this segment of the industries that we have automated and digitized had delivered around 2.7% of annualized productivity growth over 15 year average. But there's a problem that the bigger part of our world, which is a 70%, the manufacturing, the mining, the, in the, the logistics, the transportation, the whole thing, that segment, which employs 75% of the workforce only have 0.7% of annual productivity growth rate. And the other problem that we're seeing is the investments in ICT. 70% of the investments in ICT has gone to the 30% segment of the industries and only 30% has gone to the 70%. So what are we going to do? We, we're going to do is to reverse that. We call it in the Nokia Bell Labs term, the 5G or the future X era is going to reverse that equation because we're going to make sure that as we scale and automate these industries, the accessibility and the inclusion principles are somehow um, uh, we, we can grow that. And I think we've, shown, we've seen that in the COVID example. We are all trying to enable our remote lives, right? We want to make sure that we can, what we call the remote X lives. 
we want to make sure we can uh, we can control interact diagnose manipulate do all those things remotely so as we build a hyper connected and hyper automated environment in our industries we will have more inclusivity from women as well because no matter who you are where you are what you want to do you should be able to do it because of this ubiquitous uh, nature of how we would do this industry uh, automation. And I'll give you an example from our own, uh, own uh, manufacturing segment of the business. Nokia back in 2014 started what they call the conscious factory vision. We said, what is the future factory going to look like? And as a result, what are the new uh, skill uh, and the workforce that we would need? So we embarked on this journey by making sure that in parallel, we are retraining and reskilling our workforce in the area of software automation, uh, use of IoT devices, analytics, um, how to deal with uh, augmented reality tools, digital twins. And I'm very pleased to say that as a result of that, we have seen quite a bit of workforce diversity. And if I look at some of the data from some of our factories over the last four to five years, it's incredible that we have seen almost a doubling of women participation as a result of that. Because what you have done is not only increase the productivity, safety, and efficiency, but you've certainly created a level playing field by, by introducing more aug augmentation and more automation in your, in, your, in your factory floor. So there are many jobs now through physical augmentation and through cognitive augmentation, we are seeing more and more, more women, of course, as they get into the STEM areas are get, getting more opportunities and the accessibility is growing from that perspective. So I think that's a very good sign, an early indication around how automation and augmentation is helping level the playing field, but in fact, opening the inclusivity uh, factor as well. Uh, thank you, Fahad. Can I uh, ask Liat Chanter if she has any, I can see she was, you know, with her head following very closely the discussion. I would like I her hope to- I she was agreeing to it. Exactly. <laughs> so Liat, can you contribute to that? Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I agree. There's not, it's, it's, it's really what we see as well at Cisco. And I think that, you know, the more, um, the more inclusive we have, you know, we have the offering from a digital perspective. Uh, th th these are things that we'll be able to, and, and I saw a, um, actually an interesting question from, from one of the audience members on uh, rural communities, especially women in rural communities. So I think to, to extend the work that you needed us, to extend the work that NGOs do uh, into rural community and disadvantaged communities, uh, um, and groups of, of women will be able to allow them to participate, even if they don't have the funds or the physical location. So I absolutely agree with that. There's one comment that maybe I'll leave it to the end. Uh, you know, Ford, you, you mentioned AI and, and ML, or I will couple a, a, the machine learning to, to the artificial intelligence. That's interesting because as you, uh, in order to, to have a successful uh, um, machine learning or AI, AI algorithm, you need to input data and teach the machine. But when we input data, if you, if you ask women and men to rate themselves in terms of their capability to do a job, for example, we talked about manufacturing, um, women tend to rate themselves less than men. So you see that there is a bias in the algorithm. And if you don't open it to a diverse group of experts to actually teach the machine, it's, it's, uh, you have some interesting uh, results. It's a, it's a big deal for all, all the uh, you know, IT industry. Yeah, it's I think something just that is if very... I can take uh, 30 seconds, uh, Monica, I think this yes. is an excellent point, Liet. I think we at Nokia Bell Labs, we have not many, many examples of now leading women researchers who are leading in the area of AI and ML research. One of my colleagues uh, who is actually the lead on AI, she's driving ethical AI research coupled with cognitive uh, human augmentation systems because as we enter the industry 4.0 era, there will be a cognitive overload on us. And I think if, you, if, if you're familiar, there's something called the fuller knowledge curve. We are saying that we are doubling knowledge every 12 hours. And therefore what we have to do is to build um, a, a solutions and algorithms that can help transcend us beyond cognitive insufficiency, but also by having more women participant in this new area of AI and ML, we can take away the biases and make sure that the ethic, ethics of that technology is, is well planted in terms of the foundation of this. So absolutely, well, good point on that. So not only training, but also really looking at the roots 
of the training material and what we're doing in SDG sector in terms of algorithm. This is a very important point. And but Monica, I, so it's just yes. uh, half a second. I, I can think, see the uh, private sector is very active. No, absolutely. But one <laughs> thing is, I think we have to start early. I, I think Nokia is driving a lot of campaign for young girls from yes. 11 to 15 for the last yes. three yes. years. We have engaged more than 4,000 yes. girls to entice and, and yes. you know, make them interested in STEM. So that's a very, very important part I, of it. Yeah, I agree. And I've seen your video, which is uploaded in the platform for those who are listening. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, uh, very important to start early in the training uh, for, for, for everybody, for boys and girls, but particularly for girls. But I think there are also some obstacles in terms of cultural obstacles that challenge the families and the girls in particular. But I give my, I give the floor now to Bashir to, to take over, my co-chair, Bashir. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Um, so far, I was very impressed but, uh, but, but by what was said, especially by the minister, in terms of policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that if you have the right policy, then you will uh, probably, uh, you, you, you know, have the, the right solutions. So it's a good starting point. Uh, my, my question will be directed to Kara. First of all, I was uh, impressed by your resume. Uh, you, you work for several companies like uh, uh, Compact, uh, Popularoid, uh, Dutch Shell, Microsoft, etc., etc., etc. You have 27 years of experience in technology and the, the, the digitalization. So my question is the following. Uh, what did you learn uh, from leading uh, global uh, businesses through or, or outside of your association that, that is called uh, Women in Tech? That's the first question. And the, the second one would be, how uh, can we support women in tech in a, sustainable, in a more sustainable manner? Yeah, so thank you very much, Bashir, and I'm really enjoying this, uh, this dialogue so far. So um, I would like to highlight three key learnings that I've seen through, through the industry and also from uh, this perspective of this movement of women in tech. And that is um, uh, the first being, if your business has not gone digital yet, it will. Uh, so most companies uh, will become tech empowered and tech enabled. Uh, and, and these are companies, organizations, communities even. I think it's very important that as individuals uh, that we understand the phase that a company is in, in order to enable taking it to the next level. And that next level is most likely going to be something which is enabled or empowered through technology. So is, a, is that company or organization in a period of growth? Are they looking to expand or are they wanting to thrive? Um, you know, there's a, a great quote that I think says something like, you're never too young to lead and you're never too old to learn. And so, uh, you know, it's a really great opportunity for at any stage of your career to uh, get new skills so that you can help to take these companies into the next era, into this digital era. One of the ways that I think are really important, if you are in an, uh, a position of being a hiring manager or you are a candidate in the pool, be considerate of who you are uh, enabling to come into that application round when you have jobs that are available in your organization. So for instance, um, start with reviewing the job description. So we just talked a little bit about the bias that could be sitting in artificial intelligence as we start to train the machines, as we start to train the algorithms, the data that we put in, we need to ensure is not uh, uh, containing bias. It's the same thing when we're looking at the jobs that we're posting. So if we, you know, create a job description that sounds like it was only meant for a sumo wrestler, well, you're only going to get sumo wrestlers applying for that job. So you need to consider that the descriptions of the jobs are uh, lacking bias and that they sound like anyone with the skills and the competence in that field, in that area can apply for that job. That's the first step. The next is in terms of the candidate pool that you are attracting, make sure that you have already an equal starting point and that that candidate pool represents 50-50 in terms of the gender and the diversity in that pool. The third piece, it's really important, is on the other side of your, your hiring panel, making sure that you also have equal representation and diversity in that panel. So you don't want to have all the same people. We know that 
um, companies that are predominantly male funded, male founded, for instance, will tend to look for the next male candidate in their pool. So when you have more diversity in that hiring panel, uh, you will have a higher outcome in terms of a diverse candidate coming into your organization as well. The second point that I wanted to highlight is that we know and we understand that the majority of small businesses are owned by women. The second piece of this statement is that work that has been traditionally done uh, by women is being displaced by technology, by artificial intelligence, by the machine learning and algorithms that we can uh, now much more easily and efficiently and effectively recreate through uh, computer and technology processes. So think about roles in administration. How many of us use tools online like Calendly, for instance, to do your appointment scheduling yourself? Um, process orientation, logistic related roles. This type of work is very rapidly being uh, replaced and displaced. And that I think gives a wonderful opportunity for individuals doing this type of work today to look for how can I uh, retrain myself? How can I get the skills that I need in order to do the jobs of the future? Um, we need to ensure that we're enabling access to that training, to those skills, to the upskilling by giving the tools, the technology, and, uh, and the connectivity that's needed in order to get to, uh, to doing those skills. A couple of examples I could share with you. Look at Growth Tribe as an organization online, growthtribe.io. Uh, growth look at WiseNose, look at Codem, which is offering free coding skills for individuals around the world. We need to ensure that we provide equipment um, and the access to equipment, if, if that's the case. Um, as an example, through Women in Tech, one thing that I'm doing is offering an opportunity for women to get a scholarship in fields related to data science, data analytics, and cloud administration. And I've been targeting individuals here in the Netherlands who are women or who are refugees entering into the, com into the country because I want to ensure that these individuals have the skills to do the jobs that we need here now and into the future. The future is already here. The third area in this space, uh, Bashir, is to um, consider yourself um, in the role of being a role model. Uh, I feel that women lack role models, uh, individuals they can look to that are either other women or allies in the field of technology. Uh, there's a famous uh, quote around uh, empowered women empower women. And I think that's really important to imagine yourself in the role of uh, where you are a leader. You need to be looking for people who are opposite to you, people that um, you understand their passions, their talents, and the values that they bring. Um, and balancing the attributes that you have in your team or your organization, uh, where you're including also um, the attributes of the feminine archetype, which typically more women tend to possess. You know, so if I think about uh, having compassion, being caring, uh, um, having empathy, listening, collaboration. These are uh, very important traits to have in balance in an organization and in your team. And for women, it's about learning to develop your confidence uh, uh, and building up your personal brand, looking at uh, how you great, create more visibility and others that are willing to put you into the spotlight. Learn how to tell your stories, learn how to pitch your ideas, whether it's as an entrepreneur or in a boardroom and embrace, embrace uncertainty. I think that these are some very important areas, Bashir, that um, you know, as, as lessons that we've learned, that I have learned in the industry, uh, and as a movement that uh, are, are hopefully helpful also for the audience to consider how they can get excited in helping us to close this gap in, in the field of technology. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, I will uh, ask probably uh, some feedback from Amel and from Rania. Well, one minute each on what uh, Kara just said, please. Oh, yes. I Thank you very much, Kara, for all these insights. I love the, especially the, the empowered women who empower uh, women, because uh, I think uh, every woman who, who has the floor on, and who has the possibility to reiterate all these statements should say that again and again. Uh, because it's not only about ourselves, it's, uh, it's actually about a, something bigger than ourselves because it's a, it's a big business case. It's a positive business case for, uh, uh, for companies uh, to have uh, this level of diversity. It's a positive uh, uh, business case for communities, uh, for societies, and for the whole world, actually, because the, the gap is getting bigger uh, through this, uh, uh, this rapid transformation. Uh, as uh, Fouad uh, said earlier, the knowledge is doubling every 12 hours. So it's like the pace is, is uh, tremendous. And if we 
leave uh, women, uh, women are left behind in this equation, the impact is going to be massive on just everyone. So, uh, f and I also uh, also noted um, uh, this uh, the, what you just said. Uh, so you'll uh, you're never too young to lead and uh, never too old to learn. And it doesn't matter actually uh, um, if you are a woman or man to lead because I think it's actually the time for women to lead because uh, uh, leadership in the digital age is a leadership where organizations are getting flat where uh, communication is very important, where uh, empathy uh, is uh, and openness uh, is very important. These are supposedly natural skills of women. So it's actually the natural environment for women to lead. So that's why we should really encourage all women to step in and lead. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Rania, uh, how do you build your personal brand? Uh, uh, Kara was referring to a personal branding. How did you do that, like in your case? Okay, uh, let me tell you something before I start talking about the personal branding, as per the questions and as per what uh, my mate just said, it's all about inclusivity, inclusivity. Everyone should be uh, in the equation. So uh, one of the questions was tackling that someone is living in an area which is a bit far from the resources. And this is the case in Egypt. We have a huge population, but when it comes to uh, the resources, it's all in Cairo, which is the, govern rate, the main govern rate or the capital. So basically, it's all about giving the opportunities to the people in need. Everyone should have access to the resources. Everyone should have access to whatever uh, happening. So the silver lining of the COVID thing that everyone now can have huge access to the opportunities, especially online. Also, one of the questions was about the training, uh, the trainings online. So we at Entrepreneur, I basically run an organization, a social enterprise that focuses on women educa education when it comes to entrepreneurship. So we were able to outreach to different other countries other than Egypt, uh, different communities, marginalized communities, also refugees, people who are already in need of the resources. So a lot of negative thoughts happening here and there because of the situation. But the good thing is that now everything is accessible. I'm sure that whomever wrote the question already, they have access to the internet, so they can have access to whatever resources. The only thing that we should um, work on more now is the language, because sometimes the language issue is the main issue towards the resources. So we should facilitate the resources or the, the language of the delivery. For example, we at Entrepreneur, we built a platform. It's focused on the support of women themselves. It's an Arabic platform. Uh, we have a bit of English content, yet it, the main focus is Arabic. And we have people from Palestine, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, all the Arab-speaking uh, sp uh, countries. They come, they have uh, each other's support when it comes to questions related to their businesses, to their initiatives, their NGOs. And they have content. Content is free, but people, they need to find uh, the way in order to access the content. I write down in the comments or in the notes the links so that people can... Um, see what's going on and i invite everyone to start doing a small community platforms for their communities in order to give them the access to the resources everyone have something to deliver but the thing is is the linkage between the delivery between the content and the people in need so we have to work on delivering the content in a way which is in a way localized or based on the the region itself because each region they have a very specific um let's say characteristic, they, they're the only one who will understand the lingo. So that's why we have to work on building the uh, ecosystem or the small existence. Coming back to the question of the personal branding, I believe the personal branding is all about the content, what we deliver. If we have something which is real, which is impactful, and we try to deliver it, people will know us for this. We're not pro the influencing or the impacting when it comes to just showing off what we're doing. We're, we're all about the impact, what we really do. When we talk, when we uh, speak about what we do, now we have something to present to the world. And this is, I believe, the core value of the, the whatsoever, the organization, the person whomever is trying to impact anyone. So basically, this is my intervention on this. And as I mentioned, I write down the, the link of the hook. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rania. Um, you, you were referring to some kind of networking, okay? Like networking, et cetera, et cetera. But you said that one of the barriers of networking was languages. My question again to Kara will be like, what's the best way? Is there a best way for networking? How, like, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Please um, enlighten us a little bit on this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and also for the, the really energetic responses. I really appreciated the, the further context they could provide to the discussion. Um, look, for, uh, for networking and particularly for entrepreneurs, 
Um, I think, first of all, we need to recognize that women are not represented in the leadership demographics. Um, this starts often with funding. And I mentioned just before, when we're looking at candidates, um, that when funders or founders are both men in the equation, uh, that statistically there are fewer women on the board or fewer women who are receiving funding uh, as an entrepreneur. And this is taking too long for us to change the game, but we need to. And, and this uh, is something that both women need to take part in, as well as uh, the men in the audience and our allies who are here to help support and lift us up. So first of all, for, for women, uh, when it gets to um, a bit of the personal branding piece that we also talked about, women don't often know or realize the value that we bring or how to belong. And it's so important for you to recognize your value. Uh, what are your unique superpowers? What is it that makes you unique? What is it you have to bring to the table? Women often also lack an intimate understanding of the inner workings of professional circles. Um, you know, before the corona crisis, if the network that you had created for yourself and the relationship, relationships you had been building up were not strong, then they're probably also not very strong right now. Um, the reality is that we need some sort of in-person engagement in order to build that warmth, in order to build that human connection with others. And if that network wasn't strong before in the corona, it's going to be much diff more difficult right now because we have a lack of in-person engagements. Women also are not in the power networks that control the top seats, um, that are controlling the decisions at who we're going to give funding to in venture capital run rounds. And so again, really important to know and understand what uh, phase that a company is in so that you can uh, uh, understand, am I here to help a company to grow, to expand and to thrive? And at that level of the engagement to get involved in the conversation with the people who will make the difference. Look for the people who have done this before and learn from them. And then understand that companies, organization, venture capitalists are going to want to invest in those people that are going to help a company to get to the next level. So it's very important to understand where you are in the conversation and what it is you can bring to, uh, to that equation. So a few quick tips for, for my uh, lady colleagues out in there in the audience. First of all, get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Ladies, 30% is enough. <laughs> it's enough to get started. I think we tend to default to the 100%. Uh, we only apply for a job when we think we can tick every box. 30% um, is enough to get a conversation started and go for it. The next is uh, get into the credit system. So I have something you need and you have something I need. And this is where the bartering begins. This is where we need to learn to negotiate the credits that we bring and that we're looking to, uh, to receive. Also, don't stay too long on the social topics. So it's great to get that warm conversation going, let people know who you are as a human, what your qualities are and the attributes that you bring to a table. However, let them also then know what you have to offer to the company, to the solutions that that company is, is working on. And then the last piece I would just want to mention here, Rashir, is you know, mix the networks that you're a part of. If you're always fishing out of the same pond, you're only gonna catch the same fish. So mix the networks that you are involved and engaged in to meet a diverse range of people. Uh, I think there's something actually quite beautiful in a way uh, of what we are learning through the crisis that we are all in together. We're all looking at a screen together. We are all equals on this screen. And um, there's no one box that's bigger than the other. And so it makes the world feel more approachable. Um, use this opportunity now to have the contact, to make a contact and reach out in new and innovative ways to people that you're interested in where you can help them because you have something they need and they need you too. So those are some thoughts that I have where it, the networking is just vital and it has not stopped uh, despite this Corona uh, crisis that we're in um, and it cannot stop. It is vital to your business. It is vital to us as individuals to not just survive, but to thrive. Great, thank you very much. It, it, like indeed, like, like mixing the network is important. Uh, think new and innovative, we do understand. But uh, now my question will go to, uh, to, 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 uh, to Carla. What, what does ITU bring on the table? 
So thank you very much, and again, thank you for this, uh, you know, kind of aspiring uh, uh, speakers. It's always challenging to be one of the last ones because, again, uh, you know, everyone has already said, you know, great, great things. But um, okay, so ITU is, as I was saying, you know, at the beginning is the UN uh, specialized agency for information and communication technology, and uh, as part. Uh, uh, of our mandate, uh, we uh, have been, let's say, created to connect the unconnected. So um, we work uh, a lot uh, and quite extensively since now a long time on, uh, on issues related to digital inclusion and how can everyone basically benefit from, uh, from the digital environment, from, uh, and how can actually everyone, including again, women and girls can actually actively participate and be uh, content creators of, uh, of the digital world. Unfortunately, when we look at data, uh, and as, as the previous speakers has already kind of alluded, the things are not going in the right direction. Um, we, uh, from the last uh, uh, Measuring Information Society report, which was issued last year, uh, figures, uh, and especially when it comes to the internet penetration uh, rate for men and women, uh, we still have a huge gap. Uh, just to 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 to, uh, to state, you know, few uh, few uh, few 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 data uh, today. If we count basic two uh, G phones, the eighty percent of women in low and middle income uh, countries own a mobile, and the forty eight percent also use mobile internet data services. Nevertheless, two hundred million fewer women than men own a mobile and 250 million fewer women than men use the internet. The, promotion, the proportion of men using the internet is higher uh, than the, promotion, the promotion, proportion sorry, of women using the internet in two thirds of countries worldwide. And this is, this is really, really huge. And this gap is widest in South Asia, where women are less, uh, are sorry, uh, 47, uh, 48 percent less likely to use mobile internet than men. And in sub-Saharan Africa, the situation is also great, with women uh, 41 percent less likely to use mobile internet than men. Um, what we have also seen is that while the gender gap has narrowed in, more, in most regions since uh, 2013, it has widened in Africa. And in Africa, overall, the proportion of women using internet, usually over a fixed connection, is 20% lower than the promotion of men, of men using the internet. So these are just that they, I mean, some, some of the data that are, we wanted to put to the table, uh, just to say that there is a urgent need to actually act now. Just two years ago, we celebrated the half of the population being connected to ICTs. We can't really wait other 20, 30 years to connect the other half. And unfortunately, as we have seen from, from the data, a big proportion of this gap is actually represented by women and girls that do not have access to ICTs. So what is, uh, you know, sometimes, of course, you know, uh, you know, and we have discussed here is uh, what are the solutions? Certainly there is not one solution that we fit uh, for all. We need to act at different level. Uh, and, and, and ITU has been uh, kind of uh, working uh, uh, very closely with, uh, uh, with different partners uh, from, uh, you know, from private sector to NGOs, uh, to research institutions, uh, because again, everyone needs to be part of the table. And we also need to engage women and, and young women, especially when it comes to, uh, to, to, to the policy development, when it comes to really uh, bring their their challenges uh, to really uh, kind of uh, develop uh, you know the, the policy that then uh, will be actually help them to uh, to to be uh, productive in the, and have actually an impact in the social and economic um, uh, sphere. So uh, we uh, we have of course you know Girls in ICTs, which is one of our flagship, if you want, initiatives. So we have work, been working on it since. Uh, now uh, 10 years. Gersin ICTs uh, is, uh, is an annual celebration that 
is really a cele I mean, kind of celebrated now in more than 150 countries. Uh, no matter who you are, a government, private sector, NGO, uh, the fourth uh, day, uh, the fourth Thursday of each April, we celebrate uh, uh, the, the, the initiative uh, by actually inspiring uh, women and, and young girls to really take up a STEM, a STEM career or even more to really continue, uh, you know, to study STEM. Uh, and hopefully, you know, this will have an impact also at the private sector level. Unfortunately, when we look uh, as ITU, we, uh, we have uh, uh, published a gender dashboard and we can put, of course, all the links on the chat. And when we looked at our own constituencies, even internal in ITU, ITU, of course, is membership driven as a UN agency. So our main, uh, you know, uh, counterparts are the Ministry of ICTs the regulators but also the private sector and when we look at numbers and actually female representations not only at the ministry of icts level at the regulator level but also at the private sector level and this is what cara was actually mentioning the number of women are really really is really really low and we we do ask to ourselves why why is that? Uh, why is this still happening? Why women are not really feeling comfortable, not only, of course, to take up STEM studies, but to continue a career in tech? So here is where I think uh, we have a big role to play, including, of course, us at the ITU. Uh, this goes a little bit with uh, making the vacancies more appealing. Uh, we don't always want to show that technical vacancies or you know or, or you know jobs are 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 still are only for men uh, because again the women needs to be uh, kind of uh, equally uh, represented uh, uh, and and again the private sector here has, has a big role to play to really provide uh, internship mentorship opportunities uh, um, post graduate uh, kind of uh, uh, classes or courses just again to, to continue to attract the youngers that started a career stem but also with, with, the, with the possibility uh, to really uh, recruit and mainly retain the women that are actually entering in, in, the, tech, in the tech sector. Um, as just uh, uh, as something that it was uh, you know mentioned before, uh, here at ITU together with X Prize now since five years uh, we are uh, uh, we are uh, organizing a DAI for Good Summit, and just after five years uh, this year for the first time uh, we have a, a track that is really looking at gender. Um, uh, uh, Fuad before uh, just mentioned about the lack of, uh, of women working in AI and indeed that is really bringing lots of uh, consequences when it comes to, uh, to biases. So uh, uh, acting from different, uh, uh, you know, from different level, of course working on the ground in really building a capacity for, for women, for, for and entrepreneurs, but also really working with uh, with with ICT professionals to really try uh, to bridge the, the gender digital divide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bashir, may I make a, a short um, a comment to, to yes, what Carla has just shared very, very briefly, because I think both uh, Fouad uh, and Liat and Carla have all now touched on this, but I think there's something very important, um, which is in recognizing that we need to start young in exciting girls to get into technology in their course of study. I think we've now heard a lot of the statistics also where you know, girls and boys test the same when it comes to uh, the results in science, in math, technology, engineering. And the, the lack of empowerment girls have at about that age of 14, I would say, when most have to make a choice of, do I go in this direction of science and technology or do I choose a path for humanities or history? Um, the, the interesting piece here that I have learned is that at the age of 14, girls are also the most creative than they are in their entire life. And if there's one thing that we know is that we need this gene of creativity to solve some of the world's biggest problems, the biggest challenges that we have, and, if, and it's also in technology. So I think it's very important to embrace this, um, this very fascinating um, aspect that girls bring 
and the creativity, having at that right moment in time, the opportunity to say, hey, you, you have this ability, let's move you into the path of math, science, and technology, uh, because you can do, and you do score the same as boys in this field. And if parents and teachers uh, and others that they're looking up to are willing and able to empower them at that point in their life, then we have them already into the funnel of our system to continue to help them to grow and learn in the field of technology. And I think it's vital. And it's vital to capture that creative gene that girls bring into solving some of these, uh, the world's great biggest challenges that we have. Thank you, Carol. Uh, just like I would like the minister to bounce back on this one. Uh, what is done at the level of your ministry to promote women in ICT? You know, women in, in, in ICT, in entrepreneurship, you know, like, do you have something in Palestine in place? Do you have a policy? Do you have something uh, that, that you can talk about? Uh, yes, uh, at the government level, we have many uh, regulations that uh, are specialized for women. And there, we have a ministry for uh, women affairs in, in, among the government which is taking care of many uh, tasks regarding uh, women. At the level of the ministry, the, you know, the ministry is newly established and it will act uh, uh, you know, based on uh, equal opportunity for uh, women and uh, men. And based on a human, right, uh, human rights uh, approach, we will do gender sensitive analysis for any intervention that is being intended by the ministry. Uh, we started uh, a huge program in terms of coding, uh, software development, and the programming. We initiated it uh, in this month, and we dedicated 40% is the quota for women, and, uh, with, which will be the minimum share. We will provide the Palestinian market with 6,000 plus uh, uh, program developers and programmers, and that, that will have a great impact on the IT sector in, in Palestine. We started this uh, issue. Other, all, all the other interventions will look after women and will provide the equal opportunity. What I would like to say, maybe in, in Palestine, we, in terms of talency, we have a great talency in women. That, that, that's you know, the human capital among females is very high, and we can build on that uh, issue. We are looking after youth in general and with emphasis on women in particular, according to the mandate of the ministry and according to the mandate of uh, many mandates uh, among the government. What I would like to, to say is the importance of collaboration. Yeah, here in, in Palestine, we will uh, build uh, a cluster for entrepreneurship and uh, empowerment. And we need some sort of co collaboration and uh, cooperation with the region. And we are, we are working on that issue for the time being because, as you know, the uh, lessons learned from COVID-19 some things you cannot do it uh, your own self. You have to cooperate, to cooperate and collaborate with the, with the others. Because, for instance, in COVID-19, unless everybody on the on the on the on the earth takes the vaccine in the same time, we will will do nothing because at the end it will be entering again from your border. So there's a lot to do with IT. There's a high potential in in, 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 in investing in human capital, especially in women. We can do a lot together. We have many challenges at, at the global level, like food security, like pollution, like climate changes, like renewable energy. And these issues can, can be addressed in, in the same time. And I think there is a space for everybody. And we have to make sure that nobody is left behind. Thank you. Great. So thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Yes, it's all about a partnership and collaboration, indeed. Uh, now it's time to show a short video uh, and then we'll take a three minute break and then we will convey again. Thank you very much.
My name is Silvina Moschini and I'm the CEO and founder of SheWorks. I would like to tell women and girls who are interested in technology that if they want to do a career in a company in technology, today is the best and perfect time to do it because we are living the perfect storm for innovation and transformation. If they get the tool, they can conquer the world. I'm Okorua Ashimi and I run Promain and Promain, the Equals Fellowship Program. It has been an amazing journey from the online process and then to coming to Budapest, Hungary. I've met with different countries, different uh, governments, different entrepreneurs from all around the world and this has been a great exposure for me to understand what it is like to go international. Oi, meu nome é Ana Beatriz. É, eu participei de alguns cursos, workshops e palestras do Girls Can Code. Hoje eu faço ciência da computação na Universidade de Brasília e o Girls Can Code foi um dos fatores fundamentais para essa minha escolha, porque foi lá onde tudo começou, foi lá onde eu aprendi as noções básicas de codificação, software, e foi lá onde eu me vi capaz de ser sim uma desenvolvedora e ingressar na área. Então eu diria para todas as meninas que estão pensando em seguir uma carreira na área da tecnologia, para se arriscarem sim, porque... É uma área muito boa. Mulher pode ser uma programadora, uma desenvolvedora. Mulher pode codificar, mulher pode fazer tudo. Nice. Uh, uh, congratulations to uh, ITU uh, for this video. Uh, now we're going to take a, a three minute break and come back uh, to finalize. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. Um, we will in the meantime, maybe do some conference logistics um, just while our speakers take a little bit of a break. Um, as always, uh, any of this content that was discussed in this session, you can engage with it in the community boards. There are plenty of organizations in the exhibitor uh, booths who deal with some of these topics, and I'm sure they'd be happy to take questions from you. Um, and if you want, you can also organize virtual meetups, um, which you can decide on the topic that you want to organize. It has to be during the duration of the conference. And as part of this conference, we really tried to um, talk to as many public sector, private sector um, participant um, leaders um, to really try and show that women's economic empowerment is a global movement that involves so many levels and so many layers. And we have recorded messages from these leading voices. And we would recommend that you can either go in the home page of the conference platform or you can go in the gallery and all of these messages, including those that were shown in the opening session, are visible. So it's really from across, it's a cross section of society at the highest level. And um, just go check them out. They're, they're brilliant. Thank you. Hello, that's fine.
thank you all for sticking around. Um, while our panelists are making their way back, if you have any questions, um, are, we, we're really looking forward to them. So please feel free to put them in the Q&A, either on the platform or through Zoom. And uh, our moderator will uh, interact with the panelists. And if we can't answer them live, then we will answer them in chat. And again, feel free to take the conversation on in the community boards. Thank you. Good. I hope everybody stretch your legs and we are back for the second part of, the, of our second and we are supposed to finish at 4.30. So I would like now to call uh, on Amel Saidan. Amel, we received a few um, comments from the floor, from the audience, asking how the government of Tunisia can support uh, the ICT sector. And I know you work, of course, it's a long time for uh, your startup, the, your president of the Tunisia Startup Association. You have a large experience also with the Responsible Leaders uh, Network of BMW, and uh, you have a very deep knowledge of the women in ICT sector in Tunisia. So we would really like to hear from you <clears throat> Uh, some of the best practices that you have witnessed in Tunisia in terms of women entering the city sector and being employed and employ other women. And also, what is the impact, if you have seen uh, any impact of negative impact of COVID, but also positive impact of COVID uh, on, on the women's entrepreneurs? Uh, and finally, what would you ask your government in terms of support? What exactly, what are the areas that you think the government could help you more? You as an association, but in general women to enter the city sector. You have the floor, Amen. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, as uh, His Excellency early, earlier also mentioned, uh, policy making and policies are very important actually to shape the landscape, especially when it comes to, uh, to digital, to digital transformation, and for instance, to startups. Uh, Tunisia has been uh, marked well, last year by uh, an innovative uh, policy uh, kind of uh, uh, pilot or uh, project uh, that was called the Startup Act, which is actually a series of uh, exceptional measures and advantages uh, for startups that are labeled um, as innovative and scalable. And uh, here, what I'd like to really underline here is that uh, it's not all, it's, um, it's critical, it's very important to put in place policies, but it's even more important in our countries to make sure that they are properly implemented. And this is what may, made actually this experience of the Startup Act uh, create this positive momentum in the ecosystem because the implementation was, um, uh, so the, 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 the law itself was generated in some kind of a bottom-up movement, uh, but the implementation happened uh, as promised uh, in a timely manner and in a very lean way, a uh, very digital enabled way. So this was, uh, has really created a, mo a momentum where um, uh, since last year uh, with a totally digital experience, uh, 300 startups were labeled as innovative and scalable and which is interesting, 25% of these startups are um, co-founded by women. So, and this is actually an interesting number. Um, uh, one, it's a positive news because uh, Tunisia is, is so far a country of uh, controversy, uh, of um, uh, contradictions in the sense that the country is producing um, an amazing, um, uh, this is what you mentioned um, uh, earlier, Monica, uh, the, the, percent, uh, the percentage of women who are performing and even overperforming uh, men in, uh, in their university studies in, the, in STEM is 60%. Uh, so the universities are producing 60% uh, of graduates being women, but these women typically disappear in the world of work. So this is again the, the, the question or the equation that uh, Kala has also touched on. So, uh, and this is what we're trying to, um, to address and solve uh, through the, the work we're doing as, a, as an association. Um, we're also trying to, um, uh, to gather uh, numbers there because you can only manage what you can measure and this is what ITU and uh, similar organizations are also trying to do, actually build the case 
so that we can uh, speak about it, defend it, and identify where the gaps and address them. So uh, one of the areas we have uh, seen is actually the, the skills that was also mentioned by, the, by many of the speakers. But the idea is what kind of skills should we develop? So because Tunisia has, is having enough uh, women who are really uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, ICT skills, in terms of uh, numeracy skills, and advanced numeracy skills, these are CCPs, are engineers. Um, and so the challenge is, or is actually at another level. So digital transformation is bringing actually different needs. Uh, the needs, the skills that are needed in this digital, uh, the new digital world, the industry 4.0 world, world, the remote X world, uh, world is actually the um, management and communication skills, uh, self-organization and capability to work remotely, uh, accountancy and selling, um, creativity, uh, leadership. Because the, the whole dynamics of the world of, uh, in, in this digital space is, is uh, changing completely. So we have uh, uh, more of a decentralized war, uh, world of work. Uh, people are, are expected to work uh, independently. The environment is continuously changing. And this is the type of skills we're, we're trying to build through um, uh, programs that we're initiating as uh, Tunisian startups. Because uh, we think that 25% is maybe a good number. The, this is only the, the very first part of the funnel. Uh, we don't know yet how, may, how much of these 25% uh, uh, um, ends up getting funding because uh, for the funding in Tunisia, uh, like in the rest of the world, is still a boys club. So still uh, the, the percentage of uh, women represented in the funding boards and investment, co investment committees is not um, high enough to lead to a stronger, um, a strong percentage of women uh, that are uh, getting investment. And I think in each, each policy that we are designing, we should always try to target the 50% because women are 50% of the society, 50% of the, should be 50% of the active labor, uh, labor market. Um, another aspect that we're trying also to address actually through, uh, through meetups, uh, through uh, specialized uh, so, uh, webinars, putting a Zoom focus on that area, is the aspect of perception uh, of, uh, of the society, for instance. So like um, I, we have, I've spoken lately to, um, uh, to two of entrepreneurs through our webinars, and one of them is um, uh, Stirin has, uh, uh, with her uh, husband, has started actually um, a startup called Next Protein, Protein. Um, and this startup has raised uh, 11 million euro uh, in, in Europe for the, for the startup. And the, uh, the, the interesting aspect she was mentioning is that uh, she is always perceived as, uh, the startup is perceived as the startup of her husband and she's just there to support. Uh, so she's not perceived as a full co-founder and the boss of the startup. So this is actually a perception aspect that needs to be managed um, by, the, by the ecosystem, by the society, and by, by women themselves. Another uh, example is um, a co-founder of an AI company that is, uh, has been identified by CB Insights as one of the uh, 100 most promising AI companies uh, in the world. Uh, the company has raised uh, several, uh, so uh, a few million uh, euro to develop the AI capabilities in Europe and in Africa. And uh, the, uh, it, it's a company that has a female co-founder, Zohra. And uh, the, which is interesting, so she, when she presents herself, she, she, she very often presents herself as uh, the CTO and doesn't really actively and proactively mention the co-founder uh, title and which brings us back to the, uh, to the point that uh, Kara has mentioned earlier, which is the branding and self-branding aspect. Um, uh, maybe there's also an aspect that we're looking at right now, which is the, uh, which also comes under, under the umbrella of uh, perception and, uh, and, and social uh, pressures, is probably also the senior entrepreneurship. So many um, uh, women are active as uh, uh, academia professors um, and they have a wealth of knowledge and they are really interested to start uh, businesses, but the perception uh, that this is actually something for uh, younger uh, entrepreneurs uh, and also when it comes to uh, the combination of senior and women is kind of inhibiting uh, this, uh, uh, these people to, to start something. So we're trying to do some, uh, some work there as well. So, um, so uh, we never iterate often enough the policy aspect um, because if we are, uh, if women are not equally represented, uh, represented in funding and in policy, change is never going to happen. And the policy um, aspects and what we'd like to maybe to, uh, to change in, in our governments is definitely to uh, remove uh, 
uh, or in our countries, remove the barriers, which, which are the typical barriers for men and women, but they tend to be um, uh, more difficult to remove uh, for, uh, for women. Example, um, access to, uh, to markets and access to, um, uh, to customers, be it on the local or international level. So there is some work being done right now on the government, uh, on, uh, on the um, uh, Tunisian level to uh, enable the um, uh, public procurement uh, processes for innovative uh, projects and for startups, because you cannot um, uh, use the same processes as you, you use for an SME or an enterprise like for a startup. So uh, it should include uh, some open innovation processes, some co-creation processes, etc. And this is uh, something where, uh, for example, in, in the US, you'd have a quota for women. Um, uh, ranging around the 12% businesses that have to be uh, owned by women. So this is a kind of a positive discrimination that we will need to see in our countries to see a first momentum of change. And then it's going to be organic, happening organically and there, there will be enough uh, uh, momentum for things to, uh, to move forward uh, um, uh, by themselves. Um, it, uh, our devil is uh, very often also in the detail. I've uh, been talking to uh, um, an, 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 a female entrepreneur. Uh, she's just amazing. She's now right now in Colombia um, a University and she is, uh, um, she moved back to Tunisia, but decided to go back to the US because she was, it was just too, too many of a constraint to not be able to be part of the extracurricular activities. So we've mentioned earlier the skills that are developed by university um, that are just the ICT and uh, numeracy skills. All the other, other skills are typically acquired through extracurricular activities, uh, participating in events, participating in, uh, uh, in hackathons and what have you. And if the woman is concerned about very basic aspects of safety and transport when she have to go, has to go back uh, at night go back home and uh, this is an aspect that is not uh, secured so uh, this is it's, it's going to be inhibiting and in, at a very early stage and this is why you, we see that women are gradually disappearing from uh, from uh, leadership positions and from uh, from the world of uh, of tech in and the world of the startup ecosystem so maybe policies at that level that uh, that secure uh, the safety and security of uh, women at all uh, at all times um uh, and then uh, maybe we cannot emphasize uh, often enough the importance of, uh, uh, of uh, networks, uh, what, uh, what Kara also mentioned earlier. So networks and meaningful networks are extremely important to make uh, business happen and to allow also women to elevate also other women. And this is where, where the responsibility of women actually comes. Uh, proactively go and find women uh, that you, uh, you decide to take the responsibility to elevate. And this is uh, actually essential to give uh, these women the access and, sh and probably also equip them with basic skills, how to or support them with, uh, with basic skills, how to um, turn these networks uh, into business. Um, maybe a quick point to the COVID-19 uh, uh, question, since you have raised that, that Monica. So, uh, of course, these are, have been tur turbulent, uh, turbulent uh, times for, uh, uh, for everyone, but uh, uh, in turbulent times, you see also uh, new capabilities arising and uh, uh, people differentiating through different capabilities. So leadership in turbulent times is typically, is actually the um, definition of an entrepreneur because an entrepreneur uh, is supposed to take decisions on a daily basis in very uncertain times, in very, with the just 20% of the, uh, the parameters uh, a normal person would need actually to take a decision. So actually, um, the, those who are most trained uh, for turbulent times are actually entrepreneurs. So, so this should be actually the time for entrepreneurs. However, it has been challenging uh, for everyone, particularly for, for women, and has, this has been covered actually in some of the former sessions. Um, it's as easy as uh, the increase of unpaid work, care work at home, uh, whether the kids that are at home or elderly people, uh, do you have an access to a laptop or not at home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, a, it's goes back very often to very practical and small details. But uh, I think um, if uh, somebody has made this leap of faith to move to the entrepreneurship space, they will be uh, the best equipped to uh, lead momentum and also drag all the others with them uh, into this momentum. Thank you, Amel. Thank you very much. And in fact, I want to link your intervention now to, uh, to another country, Egypt. And Rania, what is the situation in, in Egypt? I mean, 
Amel gave us a very interesting portrait of what, what is needed, uh, government support, but also training to women and access. How is the situation, and particularly you were mentioning uh, when we talked about the chat, you, you see the positive challenge that is offering COVID to women. Can you brief tell us about the situation in your country and how women lead or went through the COVID? Okay. Time. But first, I totally agree with what Amel said. Uh, but the thing in Egypt is that we have a huge population. We are more than 100 million uh, Egyptian. And we had a, a huge percent of layoffs, especially when it came to the COVID thing. So entrepreneurship became a mandatory and a survival kit, not only something that people want to innovate and develop. So uh, now it's a mandate. Everyone has to do another business or find something, especially women, because we have a huge percentage of women who already either they are unpaid work, but also they work to be sufficient for their families because sometimes they spend on their families as well. So um i believe in the, the thing of collaboration but not only on the government levels and uh, on the institutional levels but uh, when it comes to the women entrepreneurs themselves the support they gave to each other as i mentioned uh, in my past uh, in my past uh, talk that we had a platform where we connected women in less than three months we had more than twelve thousand egyptian women who are supporting each other more than the support we as entrepreneurs can give them or more than any government can give them. So they built a cluster. They did some sort of a partnership where someone can provide the materials, someone else who can provide uh, resources from XYZ. Someone is good in technology. So she decided, started a business of creating websites to them. So it's more than the network or the supporting system they created to each other made them survive. So they survived the first stage of uh, being present in the market. So now they have businesses and as per the population, we have a very high purchasing power, which is of course affected by the COVID thing, but yet we have high purchasing power because usually women are staying at home, so they still purchase clothes and uh, consume uh, products. So instead of those women turning the COVID thing into a quarantine and just not doing anything, they started producing products which will definitely be a backbone for the, for the financial status for the country. They started to generate more money than the money they used to do when they had their nine to five jobs because now it's not only um, getting some cash that they have to have a paycheck by the end of the month, but they can get more money when they work more. Of course, this is the basic small businesses thing, yet they are not entrepreneurs with creativity and scalability, but they created the, the seeds where, the, where we can work with them in order to make this businesses sustainable and scalable. But the initiative itself, it happened and it happened in a very natural way without the intervention. What, we, what we've done is we created the platform. That's why I'm, keep, uh, I'm keeping say, uh, that saying that the, the ecosystem is the key. The partnerships is the key. The, the, the support that the ecosystem built is the key. But by the end of the day, we only accelerate the process, but the, the passion, the, the women, when they find the network or the space to grow, they definitely use it. So this is the silver lining. This is what I see. Of course, the, the COVID have all the negative things around it, but when we talk economics, there is something good happening. Now, education is for free. For example, before the COVID, we at Entrepreneur, we used to operate in several government rates. We used to go one or two times per year to give uh, the, the knowledge we want or to give them the education because by the end of the day, we are a company. We have limited resources. We try to support as much, but now we're serving more and more and more women in many other countries and many other uh, underserved uh, areas just because the access of the internet. Even the very poor areas in Egypt, they have smartphones. It's not a mandate, they don't have the, the, the iPhones, the very late editions of iPhones, but they have access to the internet. Even it's not very, um, very fast, but they have access to it. So here comes the point of the government intervention or how the government support. So I believe what, we, what is needed now is the tools, as exactly my uh, teammate Amel just said. So the, the, the resource, it's at the, the uh, internet, the resources, the access, we're trying to support, but by the end of the day, the, the, the bigger uh, stuff, we cannot do it alone. So the partnership between the government, the private sector, the NGOs is needed in order to give the women, the, let's say the homogeneous um, environment that will help, us, help them develop and grow uh, their businesses. So we started and um, not only us, all the organizations working with women are taking the same direction. Everyone is doing what, uh, what needs to be done. And again, it's all about the collaboration and how everyone is putting a brick in order to, be, to build the bigger image. So this is my intervention on this. I can't hear you, Monica. Sorry. 
Yes, thank you, Rania. Thank you very much. I am talk you were ta you're talking about partnership and you use this word many times. I want to go to Liat. Uh, that she, her company, herself in particular, I mean, she's a role model. <laughs> and she's also part of a company who is uh, heavily supporting uh, training, uh, skills training in the digital sector for women in partnership with UN agencies. So, um, Tell us a bit your company. How is the company actually, and yourself in particular, your story? How did you get into this sector? And uh, was it difficult? What were the challenges? You have the floor. Yes, thank you, Monica. So would you like me to start with how I got into the company? What do I yes, do there? Yes. No problem. Absolutely, absolutely. So interesting story. I, uh, I was part of the global virtual engineering at Cisco when uh, at the time my boss asked me to join the uh, uh, leadership team, so our senior leadership team, SLT, and, um, you know, I, I reflected on that uh, or upon that in, you know, many years to, to, to come kind of fast forwarding today, and I, I never, I would never know, I guess, if I was asked because um, I would make the senior leadership team look good because we have diverse and because 17 years there was no woman in the uh, senior leadership team of virtual engineering, um, or they really believed in me. Um, but, uh, you know, the reason that I thought like that is because I got the smallest part of the business with very little investment. And with, with the, the, the kind of fast forwarding two and a half years afterwards, I, I, I received 24 engineers, 30 engineers, and I expanded the business team back and expanded the team to about 150 engineers that are very uh, um, front end customer engagement and really looking at, at um, uh, uh, business results and business impact as a measure of success. Um, so, I, you know, as I started, I, I would never know, I guess, how uh, I was offered to be part of the senior leadership team, but I definitely know the, the impact and the business results that myself and my team brought to the business, to the partners, to the customers, and to the key stakeholders. So that's, in, in short, uh, my story, how uh, I managed to, to uh, get to a senior and executive leadership team in engineering at, at Cisco in Global uh, Engineering. Um, today, the situation is a lot better. I think that with a lot of initiatives that have been um, implemented and sponsored and promoted by our uh, executive leadership team and the Chuck Robbins, our um, CEO, there's, there are a lot of things that are being done on an organizational level consistently, annually, uh, monthly, quarterly, that really help uh, women and gender diversity in the company. Um, so I don't know, Monica, if you want me to spend a little bit of time on the organizational what, part. What is, what is the percentage of women in your company, in leading position and not leading position? Yes. Yeah, so, so when you look at, uh, at a technical company, you, you really tend to look at sales and engineering and the rest, more operation and, and support. And I think from an operational support, we have a good balance. So typically when you find uh, people and and, and uh, human resource and legal and finance and, and supply chain, you'll find a lot of good, uh, you know, diversity balance. I think any, as you look at engineering and sales engineering, I think that's where we have uh, a room to, to, to develop and to grow. Okay. I have to say that, that Cisco does a lot of uh, good things that I can, of course, talk about, but I think everything starts with example, and Chuck uh, Robbins and his uh, ELT are really walking the talk or, or um, they really lead by example. So we have a very gender balanced executive leadership team where we have 50-50 uh, gender diversity. Um, and as a result, it extends to different activities, initiatives and events that are happening uh, on an ongoing basis to support women development, inclusion, diversity, and especially also looking at the young generation and um, ensuring that there's an awareness amongst the girls and, and, and young children, especially female children, to understand what is possible in the IT world from an engineering perspective, self-engineering and other technical roles and leadership, of course. Thank you. And uh, what about your programs in partnership with the UN? I know you have programs with UN Women, maybe also collaboration with ITU. Uh, what is the objective, actually? And why the, why the company decided to go and invest into those programs? Yeah. So, so, so Monica, I guess that a lot of the um, uh, distinguished uh, speakers already mentioned a lot of the benefits of, of the partnership and the collaboration between governments, private sectors, and NGOs. So, um, 
I don't think we can actually promote gender diversity and provide opportunities without a partnership. So the, the policymakers make the policies, uh, the private sector, IT companies actually enable uh, women to work and to be part of the workforce. Um, again, it's, it's a cooperation or, or collaboration rather between two parties and then extending this to rural communities and disadvantaged communities such as some of the questions we, we saw on the panel. Um, we, we can ex expand and extend the, 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 um, the impact into rural communities and include everyone. And uh, Cisco and United Nations and UNIDA are working together. A, a couple of, or I think it was last year or the year before, I mentioned uh, an interesting use case with the Networking Academy at Cisco that's working together with uh, the, the public sector and really enabling um, young children and, and youth to participate in the studies of, of ICT and also connecting them to the uh, job market and, and work experience and internship, et cetera. And there was uh, an amazing case in Jordan, actually, with a startup called eStart that uh, grew exponentially and had to uh, recruit and, and build their technical capabilities, and they could have done so by hiring from the networking academy. But the interesting part is that the networking academy did the selection process looking at gender diversity and gender balance, um, looking at also panel interviews when they did the assessment center to recruit the, uh, um, the, the individuals, and they reached 50% diversity between men and women or girls and, and boys, and that allowed eStart to increase their technical capability with gender diversity and gender balance workforce, which was uh, an amazing use case. Again, this is a collaboration between Cisco, yeah. the private sector, and the United Nations with Thank government uh, policies. Great. Thank you, Leat. I have a question for everybody. I don't know who would like to answer from the audience. They're asking, how can rural farmers adapt to new technology if they can't read or write? What is the fastest way to train them? It's a difficult I, question to answer. Fuad. Can I take a stab at it? And of course, others can chime in. So I think one of the one of the principles we talked about is I think having universal connectivity is now almost a human right, almost like a human right. So we have to make sure we are incentivizing uh, policies and investments that they're connected. Once you're connected, the next layer is even if you're not literate per se in terms of reading or writing, you can develop technologies. Uh, we are working on immersive experiences where if you have if you're connected and you have that kind of immersion in terms of augmented or virtual reality, you can give visual instructions to drive people to do what they have to do. If you are a mechanic uh, trying to work on some sort of an uh, automotive, advanced automotive machinery, you could do that kind of instructions. If farmers, uh, same thing, somebody working at a gas pipeline at a remote location, you can still push down that, that intelligence in a very visual manner so that one can intuitively follow that command. So I think that I, I honestly think that technology is going to democratize value and going to bring a lot of people in, 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 in a very inclusive manner. But I would also go back to, I think the point Kara made is, there's a, there's a behavioral issue as well. Uh, I think we need to tackle. We as men, I don't want, I don't want to generalize, but we, even if we know something 10%, we believe that we know it all. But women on the other hand, even if they know 80%, they think unless they know 100%, not good enough. So I think while I can promise you, technology is, is going to disrupt stereotypes, but I think women also needs to make sure they can be much more confident in, and believe in themselves and I think that power of technology, coupled with the human yes. behavior, yes. I think would, would, would set a very strong foundation for the future. Fuad, I think you really touched on a very important point. We all agree on that. Uh, Kara, you want to say something? Please, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And Fuad uh, completely supports your, your response. And I was just brainstorming on um, some of the solutions that I'm aware of as well, where I think it's so possible to um, learn how to code, actually learn even how to code a robot, uh, if you don't have those skills in terms of reading and, uh, and writing. Um, and as you said, it's very visual. So um, two programs that I was just thinking about, um, one is called Robot Wise. And basically this is teaching children or individuals who cannot read or write um, to use colorful blocks and shapes in order to put commands into an online setting and literally program a robot. Uh, and then you can see your robots dancing and whatever dance, you know, to, uh, to music online. 
Another program is something that was developed by MIT University in the United States, and it's a program that is called Code Spark. Mm -hmm. And Code Spark is for children, also, again, very visual um, in terms of using colorful blocks um, to uh, uh, program something on your screen. And basically, so I have actually volunteered at schools in the south of Amsterdam to train uh, and teach children how to use Code Spark. And uh, you give in one hour uh, a lesson and a chance uh, to um, learn how to code. And basically you're moving an object through a maze by giving it commands that are going to make it move left, right, up, down, giving it a design, giving it an image or a face. And at the end of that one hour, children can uh, see their code and run. And they, they literally hit a big green button, which is go. Uh, and then when you see that code run, even if it's, um, you know, a cat that's walking through a maze to a piece of cheese at the end of the day. Uh, it's just fantastic to see the reaction from children um, and children of all ages, you know, who have just learned how to code something. And that's the magic, in fact, of technology uh, as well. So look at Code Spark, which I think there's a, a, an opportunity to download that for free, um, certainly at least in a trial version. And RobotWise, if you're interested in learning how to program a robot uh, online. Uh, thank you. Leanne, do you want to and Monica, if I, yes, yeah, if I may add, so, so I think what I'm hearing, and, and I'll add on that, so, so it's really, if you look at women who cannot read and write, and they want a career, or they want to participate in, in, in coding, and, and, and all these sort of things, I think, if, if you put a spin of, on, of children on that, and you look at uh, Alice and, and uh, Scrat Jr., my four-year-old can do that, so she cannot read and write, so I think if you just put a spin and take the children capabilities of, of teaching and learning self-paced with, with a smartphone or with an iPad, you can apply that on women and they could absolutely, you need to start somewhere. Yeah, thank you. Katla, you want to say something, please? Yes, yes, hi, and again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you also for, for the question. No, I think that, you know, uh, you know, sometimes we also need to think in terms of innovative uh, solution, right? Especially to really achieve, uh, you know, or at least to connect, uh, you know, uh, women and young girls, you know, in, in rural areas. For instance, we know that, you know, uh, the satellite uh, company and, uh, companies and the satellite you know, technologies are uh, really providing cost-effective solutions to really uh, bring uh, uh, coverage to uh, to rural areas, and this, of course, you know, would uh, would uh, would help then women and, and young girls, you know, to uh, to actually, you know, uh, be part of of, of the digital environment. Uh, another thing is that at you actually in partnership with with Cisco, uh, we are di we are uh, establishing digital transformation centers. Uh, mainly you know in developing countries where again uh, there is the possibility uh, through the centers to really reach the community and to actually uh, get the necessary digital skills that uh, are, are needed uh, you know at, at the community level um, therefore i think that you know sometimes is uh, of course there are there are connectivity and infrastructure issues but i think that again if we think a little bit out of the box and you know bringing a really innovative solution and again uh, here uh, the entrepreneurship world uh, you know is uh, is one of the best i mean uh, could could uh, could i mean we can we can really find some uh, some uh, some good solutions thank you thank you carla so now we are almost closing the panel i mean we are already three minutes late but i would like to ask you one takeaway from each one of you starting from the minister excellency Yeah. One, yeah. One takeaway for our audience that is sending very nice messages and is thanking us for our interesting panel. Yeah, it's regarding the women right to access to IT globally and in addition the, the collaboration between the regions. Thank you. Thank you. Amel? Amel. Uh, ML, like the, the machine learning, no? Exactly. <laughs> I have the right name for the right uh, era. Um, so um, I think it's really about uh, offering uh, people opportunities and the space, and they will turn, they will make something out of it. And this is so valid for women and digital 
And I know a, a striking example is a woman who doesn't know how to write and, uh, uh, write and read. And she is uh, buying stuff over the internet, using voice messages. She has downloaded uh, uh, an yes. SMS reader. So it's like, just give them the opportunities, make, okay. it, make it accessible in an equal way. Great, thank you. Rania. Uh, my last takeaway is it doesn't take only women to uh, do the empowerment process. It's an all-inclusive. Everyone should be part of the process. It's not only uh, them or us who will be the one responsible. So if we, if we, if I'm going to give a recommendation that we have to work with women and men as well in order to do yes. the balanced equation of support for everyone. Yes, absolutely, Cara. Yes, thank you so much for this opportunity and the, the great dialogue. I learned so much also from each of you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, look, we, we're, we're in a crisis still globally, and I would say let's not let one crisis lead to another. Uh, it is so important that we enable women um, and ensure that we don't create even greater inequities uh, as a result of um, what technology can offer by having a very diverse uh, approach to the, the greatest challenges we have on the planet and ensuring that we include women in the solutions. So um, if you, you will, will be a part of the problem if you're not part of the solution. So uh, let's think about how we can enable and empower every woman uh, on the planet to be a great technologist and to become a great woman in business. Thank you, Carla. Carla. Uh, that we need to believe in it and we need role models, including men. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What? I would say that, look, uh, COVID is accelerating our remote X lives. Uh, we will further massively accelerate the digitization of our industries. It's time for women to go all in with, with full hope and belief in it because we are reprogramming and almost unlearning what we know uh, in terms of how we have been um, going to be operating our future businesses. So equal opportunity is on the horizon. Now we should just take it. Yeah, Liat? Yes, I think that uh, in order to take opportunities, you need to believe in yourself. Uh, and I think that a lot of this has been uh, said during the session, but very important for all the women on the, you know, in the audience. Um, to, 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 to just remember that we have and you have the skills and you have the skills to take these opportunities. And one thing that will leave with all of you, those of you all over the years who told you that soft skills are soft are actually pretty hard to master. And as you go into a leadership position, especially in the technology companies, the soft skills that are empathy and cultural intelligence and emotional intelligence are key to, success, to succeed and to success. And as I said, very hard to master. So there's nothing soft about them and they're connected uh, directly to results of the bottom line of the company. So just remember that. Thank you. And I want to, like to ask also my co-chair, do you have a takeaway? Um, yes, um, uh, just keep the faith and I think that we will all succeed. Okay, good. And my takeaway is that I really, again, we reaffirm that we have to work in collaboration. We are a community, so we have to help each other. Everyone does his own work from the government. And thank you, Mr. Rosama, my excellency, to participate to this uh, conference. I also thank all the other participants who have been very generously dedicating their time yes. to this this platform, I'm sure that we will uh, continue our, our activity to support women in the ICT sector. Thank Absolutely. you very much to Thank all. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all uh, to all the audience members who joined us for this very important and very rich roundtable discussion. Any of the questions um, that you had that uh, you would like to continue in a conversation, please, we welcome you to do so in the community boards and also um, to perhaps look up some of the speakers and see if they'll engage with you. Um, it's, been, it's been an incredible roundtable discussion and we hope to see you in the next roundtable discussion happening at 5.15 on responsible leadership in industry, which is co-chaired with the Gender Alliance of the BMW Foundation. And there's an incredible lineup there as well, looking at how um, leadership and industry can be responsible and take the necessary steps to bring change. So we look forward to seeing you there.